It's all them kids. It means get out of here, JJ. Bye, JJ. There they go. Got your Bibles. Open to Genesis chapter 45. We started some. One of my problems right now is from being around Pastor Mike and Pastor Gary and, and Pastor Rick this week and other, other, other ministers I've been with uh, at this conference I was at in Oklahoma. I'm so full. Sam, I'm so, yeah, I don't get full a lot. Matter of fact, let me just mention to you about full. The, all of you, you run at such a high pace, Steve. We go, 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 and, and we drain. And so what, when you come to the house of God, I've always taught our band this. I've taught our ministers that life is circular. It's not linear as much as it is this. And there's times in life you're on top. Man, you got a job promotion. Your, your kids were blessed and got a job. Hey, man, you're on top. Things are rolling good for you. But then in life, there has to be a Monday. Everybody say, has to be a Monday. Has to be a Monday. There has to be a time in life where you exhale and you, and you go down. You just head back down. When you get down, if you're not careful, you think that's a norm. And when people that live here are the people you hear always depressed, always pessimistic. Shy, look at me. Stay away. Leave me always right here at the bottom. They, they just hang out here because they forget how good it was up here. And they do nothing to get back up here. They don't pray. They don't fast. They don't give. They don't witness. They don't do anything to get back up to the top. They're waiting on somebody else to help them. One of the things we do as a, as a church, best at my ability, as I want to be up when I'm on this pulpit. And so when you leave here, you might come in down, but I want to grab you and yank you to the top. So when you walk out of church, Melissa, you feel good. You say, now that was good. I got a little charge in me to help me out through the week. Now, in all, when, I, when you do that to somebody, though, inevitably it brings you to the bottom. Because you've yanked them up to the top. Now you've given it all out, and now you're at the bottom. So Mondays often is a recharge day. It's a day to get your head back right and move on. For some of you, you, have, you use vacations for that. You, you take opportunities to get away for that or just take some type of break. I'll be honest with you. If, I, if I'm on my tractor or on a lawnmower or working, I, I can recharge. It's weird. Work recharges me. It gets me excited again. To see something completed blesses me. Just to see it finished, because I deal with people all the time. And you know what? People are never finished. They're three steps forward, two steps back. You know, and so you deal with your kids. You know what I'm talking about. So life is this way. And because it's that way, we find that David goes to the cave after uh, Saul chases him and after he kills Goliath. Greatest victories of his life, he's in the cave. Elijah uh, takes out the prophets of Baal. Jezebel says to Elijah, I'm going to kill you. You remember that? Do y'all remember the story of Jezebel, Ahab? We still got those same spirits in the world today. We still got Jezebel spirits and Ahab spirits and Baal spirits and worshiping other things. And so all that's still going on. But here you've got uh, Jezebel prophesies and tells Elijah, this time tomorrow you'll be dead. 24 hours you're going to be dead. You know what? Don't listen to uh, and I've used this word already, but to the demonic. Don't listen to somebody trying to prophesy your life or prophesy. lie. How many know that's a prophesy? lie? Because it was a lie. Because she said, this time tomorrow you'll be dead. He goes and hides in a cave. Where's he at? He's at the bottom of his circle. He said, God, I'm the only one serving you. I'm the only one across me that loves you. I'm the only one around here that cares about you. And God says, not here. I got 70 prophets that haven't bowed their knees to the prophet Baal. Or to the to the, uh, uh, the the God of Baal. So you you good? Wake up. And then he heard the still small voice. Remember that that story. The issue to me when I read this is is after that Elijah goes back up to the top. And we have the meeting with him and Elisha. It's another story, great story. But do you remember what the woman said? Jezebel said, "This time tomorrow you'll be dead. I give you twenty four hours and you'll be dead." Guess what? One week later, Elijah wasn't dead. One month later, Elijah wasn't dead. Ten years later, Elijah wasn't dead. A hundred years later, Elijah wasn't dead. Three hundred years later, Elijah wasn't dead. Do you remember the story of Elijah? God took him up in a whirlwind. Amen. Elijah never saw death. That's why I said she prophesied. 
She lied about it. Some people have been lying about y'all. They've been saying, you ain't going to make it. This is it. You're never going to serve God again. Your kids ain't going to serve God. They prophesy lying. Amen. Elijah, when we've seen Elijah again, he's standing on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus and Moses. Hmm. Don't tell, don't tell God. No, don't, 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 don't tell somebody a future that you're not sure about. You know, I, I reached into my, I put this jacket on this morning, and I reached in it, David, and I found money. I mean, I found a Benjamin in my pocket, and I opened it up. And on this Benjamin, it said, in God, we trust. In God, we trust. But I find that people don't believe that. They believe in the Benjamin, but they don't believe in the God. On the Benjamin. In God, everybody say, in God, we trust. See, the issue in trusting God is you've got to believe in providence. Providence is an amazing thing. Have you found the book of? Genesis, I gave you an easy one today. Are you comfortable? When you say, I trust God, that's a heavy thing. But as a believer, it is one of the greatest uh, opportunities. It is, the, it is the belief system that holds us to the book. It holds us to one another because we have, we, we're so different. We, we're not unified. We're different. We economically, racially, we're different. Uh, but, but there's something about our, our compatibility because of the gospel that has shifted our, our thinking. We're together as brothers and sisters. And this is the story of Joseph. And, and, and when you understand about Joseph, he was the favored son of the father. And remember, favor is not fair. Bring me up just a little bit, at least in the monitor. Says, favor is not fair. Everybody say favor is not fair. So here he is. He's the youngest son there of Jacob. Jacob later, of course, was known as Israel. He was the object of envy by many of his brothers. The day came when his brothers took him. They sold him into slavery. Uh, they put him in a pit. They dipped his coat in goat's blood. They brought the coat to Jacob, said, your, brother, your son is dead. Uh, after this, the selling, he was at Potiphar's house. You know about the, the case with Potiphar's wife, the leaving of his jacket, the trumped-up charge on him. He ended up in jail while he was in jail. Genesis 39 tells us that Joseph gained favor with Potiphar because the Lord had blessed him. And eventually, you know about the pursuing, and then he ends up in jail. There in prison, Joseph prospered again. He gained the respect of his fellow prisoners and the guards. This happened because the Lord was with him to bless him. I understand this. That's truth. I spent time in jail, many of you know that, uh, for protesting against abortion. During that time, I had favor with the guards. I had so much favor with the guards that they allowed me to go and do things that others were not able to do. I, I was, it wasn't in a, one of them minimalist uh, camps. It was in uh, Austin, Texas. I was in with, with all type of different uh, criminal elements. I almost got in a fight in jail, remember that. But I also know that in my last day in jail, a guard came to me and thanked me for coming. When a guard thanks you for coming to, to jail, amen, I had a 60-day sentence when he thanks you for coming then you know that something good happened in that jail. Can I get an amen? But what, let me tell you what happened. We made life easier on the jailers because prisoners were getting saved. They were coming to my church service, and because when you get saved, things begin to change in your life, and you're no longer the, the problem you were that put you in jail. All right. So there in prison, he gained this respect, and eventually the cupbearer and the baker were thrown into the same prison. Joseph befriended them. One night, they both had dreams they could not interpret. Joseph was able to interpret it. Sometimes you don't want to ask about your dream. Amen. And when he interpreted it, the baker said, tell me about my dream. Uh, Joseph said, uh, you're going to get hung. And he got hung. The cupbearer, though, you know what a cupbearer is? He's the one that drinks for the king, and he, he takes the drink. In other words, when he drink, the king needs a drink, the cupbearer drinks it. If the cupbearer don't die, then he keeps his job. If the cupbearer dies, you, you, you look at the resume, somebody willing to drink after the king, before the king. And then, then they're able to keep their job. That's what a cupbearer does. He serves the king. He eats a little bit and drinks a little bit before. What a job, huh? You're talking about having faith. So the cupbearer goes back. He ends up before the king and, or before Pharaoh. Now, this is the amazing part. 730 days later. Everybody say 730. 
730 days later, 17,250 hours had passed. And the cupbearer said, I know a man in prison, Pharaoh, that can answer your dream. Pharaoh had a dream he had no answer for. And it took 730 days. Two, almost two years later, Joseph gets out of prison. We want things to happen this week. We want things to change. We want our, our, our marriage to change. We want our, our, our kids to change. We want our bodies to change. We want, we want everything to happen immediately. Uh, we won't do the, 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 what it takes to make it happen, but if there's a pill, we'll take it. All right, so eventually the famine sets in there in the east, and Joseph, his father, told his sons that they are to go to Egypt, buy some grain. They go, and then in the process, they meet Joseph. And only they don't, they don't, they don't know it's Joseph. And this happens twice in the story. When then Joseph re reveals his true identity, they're shocked, and then they're scared and because they know they betrayed him, and it's coming back on them. Genesis 45, verse 8 and now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years. And there are yet five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you, for you, a remnant on earth. And to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here. It was not you that put me in the pit. It was not you that put me in Potiphar's household. It was not you that put me in a prison. It was not you that put me before Pharaoh. God put me here. You ever realize God put you in a fix to fix you? That a lot of things you're going through in life right now. And listen, I, have a, I had a sister that was disabled. Of course, you know that my story, she passed in a wheelchair. I asked God why. I was born with a muscular dystrophy. My brother, my sister, my mom's already crippling from it. I asked God why. My grandfather shot and killed my uncle who I was named after. I asked God why. You have the same stories. You all have the same questions. I can go on and on about the questions I have in life about ministry. And I ask God why. Why did this happen? Why, why have I I've buried most of my best friends? Why, why have I I've gone through these things in life as I've gotten older? Why? The issue goes back to one statement. In God, we trust. Say it again. In God, we trust. Listen, this will be a, this will be a life-changing message if you catch hold of this. But here's Joseph that said, And God sent me before you to preserve you, for you, a remnant on earth. Keep alive for you, many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh. I ain't his boy. I'm his daddy. Who's your daddy? Amen. He said, I'm, I'm Pharaoh's daddy. He made me a father to him. He chose me as his daddy. I told you that sons always choose their daddy. And Lord of all his house and ruler of all the land of Egypt. And that ain't the end of the story. The brothers go back to Canaan. They tell their daddy he's still alive. He still can't believe it. But eventually they convince him to come to Egypt there. And he makes a trip. He's reunited with his son. He had given up for dead for many years. He meets the Pharaoh. What a, I mean, that's like meeting the most famous person in the world. He offered to let Joseph's family settle in Egypt for as long as they want. He, there he stayed. Finally, jo J Jacob, or Israel, dies at age of 147. Now, now it's just Joseph and his brothers. Now that it's just Joseph and his brothers, the barrier, and this is it. Many of you as parents have been barriers between your kids and something else. You know it. You know that if you're dead or you're gone or you're taken out, your kid's going to have to deal with some stuff. Amen. It's, it, it's in all our lives. Some of you have done real well with your kids. You know when you're gone, they're going to be fine. But others of you think, if I ever leave, I don't know what's going to happen to Junior. My God, Sally's going to be on her own. Amen. And when Jacob died, the brothers said, we in trouble now. We are in some trouble now because now that he's gone, Joseph's going to turn his vengeance. The only reason he'd been kind to us is because of our daddy. What they forgot was Joseph's daddy. Go, go be seated. Keeping you up too long. I'm the only one who's supposed to stand up this long. Listen, then, then we go to Genesis chapter 50. After Jacob died, 
The embalming took 40 days. It took 40 days to bury him. That's how popular he was. The Egyptians even mourned for him. When your enemies or the people who are not your own mourn for you, that means you influence them. And they mourned for this man who had delivered to them this boy named Joseph. They mourned for his death for 40 days. Amen. His memorial took seven days to take place. Genesis chapter 50, verse 14. After burying Jacob, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had accompanied him to his father's burial. But now that the father was dead, Joseph's brothers became fearful. They're scared. Now Joseph will show his anger and pay us back for all the wrong he did, we did to him, they said. So they sent his message to Joseph. Before, before daddy died, he told us to say you this. Now how many know this ain't true? To say to you, please forgive your brothers for the great wrong they did to you. For their sin is treating you so cruelly. So we, the servants of the God of your father, beg you to forgive our sin. Then Joseph received the message. He broke down and wept. Now, here's the boys. They're still lying about it because daddy didn't say this. We don't have any record that daddy made this statement. But this is what happened. When, when they made the statement to Joseph, he was moved to tears. And then, he, then his brothers came, and they threw themselves down before Joseph. Look, we are your slaves, they said. But Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intend to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. So don't be afraid. Don't, don't, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. How many know that kindness is, an, is, a, is a word that everybody understands? Amen. When you come, I'm on the plane. I'm on the plane going up to Oklahoma City. On my way there, I'm sitting by a young lady. We got two things in common. We both love our wives. All right, so as we're flying, I'm sharing a little bit about my life and testimony, and the plane starts bucking. I've never been on a plane like this before. But she looked at me, and she kept saying, you're the kindest man. You're so kind. Why are you so kind? I said, it doesn't take a lot of effort to be kind. Why can't I be kind? I didn't want to just, just immediately say, you know, you're going to hell. I didn't want to do that. So, so we on the plane, and, and all of a sudden, we all hooked up, and I'm watching people that got their drinks and their books. We hit turbulence. When I say turbulence, I'm talking about a good eight-second ride. Drinks were flying in the, in, in the plane. Amen. Books were flying everywhere. All of a sudden, she done grabbed hold of me. She got hold of my arm. Her eyes are white, rolled back, and everybody screamed, ah! And I actually did this. yeah -ha! She looked at me and she said, you crazy preacher. I said, I said, look, if we go down, I'm okay. If we stay up, I'm okay. So I'm okay either way. And she's got that face like, oh, my God. <laughs> How many know kindness is a language that everybody understands? Amen. It, it, what, what a joy to have that moment. It was like, and I'll be honest with you, I, I wasn't lying. I enjoyed it. It had been a while since I'd been yanked and bucked and jerked like that, man. I mean, I felt alive again. All of a sudden, I'm alive. And everybody's just, yeah. And, and listen, it's the first time I've ever been on a plane, and I have traveled thousands of miles, that when the plane landed, everybody clapped. And I'm wondering why they're clapping, you know. I mean, it's just, they clapped because they, they, they survived it. When we see the pain of a fallen world, we wonder where's God. Over the centuries, the greatest minds have wrestled with the problem of pain, suffering. And still the questions come, why me? Why now? Why this? The story of Joseph helps you understand this. You know, here, here's some questions you've got to ask yourself at times. Do you know why you were born? Have you answered that question in your mind? Well, I was a mistake. Did, did I adopt three mistakes? Because I'll tell you, no. My three children are not mistakes. They're actually God-given. I'm the only person I know in the world that can put up with them three. And them three know that, 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 that they need a daddy like me and vice versa. They have brought such joys into my life. Uh, Lori, when I married her, had two daughters. Again, the joys of my life. Your children, the joy. Why, do you know why you're here? You need to answer that question. My, second, do you know who you are? Well, when somebody said you're a child of the king, what does that mean? See, when I flew up to Oklahoma, you know what I was thinking? I was carnal. In my mind, I was carnal. 
Because the last time I was there two years ago, I helped a man in Florida who had just got hit by a hurricane. Some of you remember that, Hurricane Michael. This church sold $10,000 into his church after it was destroyed. I'm not talking about flooded. It was destroyed. And then we brought a crew of men down to his property in uh, uh, Panama City and helped rebuild a sanctuary about half his size, put a ceiling in, electricity in, and chairs in so he could have church in this building. This man stays in continual contact with me. As a matter of fact, he's bringing a crew over to help us with our flooded situation as soon as we give the green light. Now, here's the, situ- here's the, here's the thing with all that, though. When, 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 I, when I look back on it, I'm thinking, I'm going to go up to Oklahoma now because I done did this great deed. I got this thing started. They're going to bless me like that. That's carnal thinking. When that plane landed, God spoke to me. He said, you ain't getting a nickel out of here, son. Your trust has to be in me, not in the people around you. Now, I will bless you through people, but this ain't the, I'm going to feed you while you're here. I'm going to bless you. And oh, he did. He poured into me. I mean, the, the wealth and the, and the blessings in my life, they just keep increasing and increasing. But the bottom line is, I was looking in the wrong place to try to get help for our churches. Amen. So God said, I, just trust me. Everybody saying, God, we trust. You got to trust him. You got to trust him through life. You, and you, when you say it, you got to believe it. So do you know who you are? I'm a child of the king. I'm the son of my father. Amen. I understand who I am. Next, are you willing to wait for God? He waited 24 months in that prison before he got out. Amen. In order to, and he had already interpreted dreams. He had blessed people in the prison. Joseph's life, it takes, I think, 25, 30 years to get him from the pit to the palace. Are you willing to wait on God? Are you willing to wait for the mate? that God has for you? Are you willing to wait for that job that God has for you, that career? Are you willing to wait? And some of you say, Pastor, at my age, I can't wait on nothing. <laughs> Amen. Uh, next, how big is your God? When you think about how big is he, uh, are you ready to face your past? Have you dealt with it? <clears throat> do you want to be set free in life? Do you just want to live a life of freedom and grace and mercy? Are you satisfied with God? Whoa, that's a good one. How will you be remembered? How will you be remembered? Will I have to lie at your funeral? How will you be remembered? The legacy that you leave here. Everybody has a destiny, but everybody needs to leave a a legacy. Leave something behind. Amen. To make sure somebody remembers you were here. Here is the, 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 the final question here. Can you trust God with the details of your life? Even the littlest details. Amen. The small things. And I've seen God over and over and over in my life. I have remembrances of things that took place. I had a class ring uh, that, that I lost. That I didn't lose it. Somebody stole it. Broke into my apartment. Stole it. I was uh, 20, 21 years old. Big purple uh, wildcat. Carver Heights wildcat. I lost it. 20 years later, my mother sends me a, a gift for Christmas. I open it up. And in that gift was my old class ring. Because God had saw fit that a little girl in Florence, Alabama was playing with it. Teacher saw it, picked it up, looked at it, saw my name on the inside, found my mama in Tuscumbia across the river, sent that ring back to my mama. My mama sent it to me, and I looked at that ring. I thought, I lost it forever. God has the littlest details. The littlest details. Y'all, the, the green rook card, the green 12. You can't play rook, the game rook, without a green 12. You lose that green twist. And we played rook all the time. We would disciple people with, with board games and things like that when I first got born again. Because everybody wants to go out. We had to find some fun stuff. And I liked that game. I lost a green 12 out of the deck. When you lose it, you got to buy another one. Now, some of you think, well, just go buy another deck of cards. That ain't the way I lived. That ain't the way I was living. I, I worked for RC Cola. I drove a, a, a Nova, a, a, a hot rod Nova. It was, it was pumpkin color, orange and black. Black stripes on it, it got about, uh, 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 about four gallons to the mile. You know what I'm talking about? It just, that thing just sucked gas. I'm down to a Sunday night. I, I, I promise that Sunday night of fellowship, I'm going to bring some RC Colas. I ain't got, uh, I got, I got a couple of dollars. This is the way, the way I live. I had a couple of dollars to my name, and I promised I'd bring drinks. You get three for a dollar. I brought three 32-ounce RC Colas. This is back in the 80s. You know what I'm talking about? RC, some of you might remember the, the glass uh, leaders, and I bring them to the fellowship. I, had, I go to the mailbox the next day, and there's a check in the mail for 20 bucks you say what 20 bucks do it bought a half a gallon a half a tank of gas to get me to thursday to my paycheck this is the way we lived so i couldn't just go out and buy a pack of of uh, rook cards didn't have the money for it 
So I'm at RC Cola. I'm flipping over cartons. You have to flip cartons. Some of you don't eat. This is so foreign to some of you. But we had a bottle washer, and we washed them old bottles. And then after you wash the bottles, you filled up the, the drinks, and then you put the RCs in the cartons, and then you stacked them. Well, I'm flipping cartons over, cleaning them out, getting new ones in, and I flip over a carton, and a green 12 rook card flies out of the carton. I ain't lying to you. Amen. It ain't worth going to hell over a dying about a green rook card. Amen. So that card flips out of there, and I look at it, and I pick it up, and I realize this is a green 12. I go home, I put it in the deck. It matches perfectly with that deck. And, I really, and what hit me was how much God loved me. 50-something cards in there, and God picked a green 12 to give me? Come on, give me a Jesus amen. This is what I'm talking about. It's the little details in your life. And as we journey, you see Joseph's story. I've been impressed over and over again that the real hero of his story is not Joseph. It's God. Joseph's life illustrated perhaps better than any other story in the Scripture the profound truth out of Romans chapter 8, verse 28. For we know that in all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called are the called according to his purpose. So when you're looking at life, you realize how much God loves you. The little things begin to take place. In many ways, Joseph's whole life is the Old Testament illustrated, amen, of the profound New Testament truth. In our hearts, we know that Romans 8, we say it a lot in our over and over, it has to be true. It's trusting God. It's providence. Everybody say providence. Now, the word providence is not found in the Bible. But providence, it, 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 uh, how would I say it? The principle of providence is, it's over and over in Scripture. If it doesn't answer every question, at least it provides the only possible basis for understanding. In the English, the word providence has two parts to it, pro video. Pro for video. In other words, to see before. To see before. I heard someone make this statement to me once. It must have been all right for God to sacrifice his son because he knew that he would be raised from the dead. Right? But I don't look at I look at he sacrificed his son, that Jesus came to earth to die in our place. What a painful thing for a father. Even if you know that he's going to be raised from the dead. That's providence. In other words, you understand that God knows the, the uh, beginning to the end. He knows all of these things are going to happen. So when, but we struggle with it. Trust tells me that I've got to believe and see something before. So when I ask God to heal my body, when I ask God to, to, to bless uh, my friends, i got to believe, though I'm asking here and I'm not seeing it, for the video, for the providence, it's going to happen. i got to believe that when I sow a seed, whenever I give, and when I have my tithe or whatever it is, when I sow it here, it's going to come back to me over there. Many times it's the reason we, we don't trust God. We, we, you know why you don't trust Him? Because you don't tithe. You don't give. You don't give properly. You're afraid to. You're afraid if you do, it ain't going to happen back over here. But providence says that if I give... I'll receive. Amen. Press down, shaking together, running over. Yeah, so I, I, this is a principle I've lived by for 30-something years. I've given myself out of trouble. When I didn't have it, I still gave it. And listen, for God so loved, he gave. It's giving something you don't want to let go of. I don't want to let go of my son. It's easy to give an offering. Said the chicken to the pig. I said, said the chicken to the pig. They walk in together, the chicken and the pig. And they say, what's going on? They said, farmer's having breakfast this morning. And the pig said, what's he having? He said, bacon and eggs. And the chicken said, well, said I'll give an egg. <laughs> Hello. Well, you give that bacon, boy, it's over. <laughs> it means you now you belong there. Listen, when I, when I walk through the Word of God, I see God's gracious oversight of the universe. Oversight means that he directs the course of affairs. He sees the beginning from the ending. God didn't just start this thing back off and say, all right, y'all have it. Amen. He's still intervening. He's still working. He's still doing things. Amen. He's unfolding the meaning of God's providence here. Look, the Bible says he upholds all things. He governs all things. He directs everything to its appointed end. He does this all the time and in every circumstance. He does it always for his own glory. God don't roll dice. God doesn't roll dice and take a chance. He planned you. 
He wanted you here. First, listen to me. God cares about the tiniest details of life. Nothing escapes his notice, for he's concerned about the small as well as the big. In fact, with God, there is no big, there is no small. <laughs> Your stuff, well, that's big to you as well. No, 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 there's no big. He knows when a sparrow falls, and he, he's counted the hairs on your head. Not only that, he knows where number 347 is right now that you lost. You're rubbing your head. Don't do that, man. I, I know that how to get you there. Uh, but he knows where they're at. He, under, he, he knows that. He, the Scripture teaches those are the little things, but it's not little to him. He sets the day of our birth, the day of our death. He ordains everything that comes to pass in between. Second, he uses everything and he wastes nothing. There are no accidents with God, only incidents. Let me say it again. There are no accidents with God, only incidents. They, they're incidents that took place. This includes events that seem to be a senseless tragedies. Tragedies. I went to Bible college with a guy that led me to Christ. Two guys led me, Randy and Bubba. Bubba was one of the guys that went to, uh, Randy's been here to church. Bubba was a good friend of mine and uh, led me to Jesus. Went to Bible college with him. He married a young girl named Vicki. They started a ministry in North Alabama. Had a little girl and then a drunk driver hit his wife and daughter. They buried them both in one coffin. I don't have an answer for that. I don't have an answer for it. Bubba's remarried, has children now, life has gone on. I don't have answers for that. These incidences that take place. That's why I have to trust God. When I say in God we trust, it, this hit me harder and harder. When the flood hit the second time, when my home is decimated, when all my stuff's out in the yard again, and I look back at it and I say, God, you are so good. You're so good to me. It happened on a Thursday and there's an RV already sitting there by Sunday, Saturday. You allowed me to have a place to stay. You didn't destroy my house. You've given provision. We'll have it back up. Things will be fine. Uh, where them louver doors I hated, we'll take them out. I'll finally have a real door there. You know, there are things I wanted to change anyway. So you, you're so good. It's how you look at it. It's how you see it. I trust him. I don't know what's taking, but I'm meeting new people. We've already had people come in from Indiana. We've had people coming in from, I'm connecting with people. It would have never happened had it not been for the tra flood, the tragedy, the things that take place in life. They, they connect us. I got to move, man. I, I'm seeing this. Uh, so everybody, listen, you've heard me say this over and over to you. If it's not God sent, it's God used. If God didn't send it. God can use it. Watch him do it. You say, a lot of people say, well, God should, shouldn't have done it. God didn't do it, but he can use it. Amen. Let him use it. Third, the ultimate purpose is to shape his kids into the image of Jesus. I couldn't be like Jesus unless you go through stuff. It's what you've endured in life that makes you more and more like Christ. Romans 8, 29. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So again, he knew us in advance. Many scriptures in the word of God teach us that. Acts 17, 26. For one man, he made all the nations. I don't know if this is on the overhead. But, but I, Acts 17, 26, and, but they should inhabit the whole earth. Made one man set everything in motion. He marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. In other words, I was born for this time. You were born for this time. God did this so that what? That men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any of us. For in him we live we move, we have our being. As some of the poets have said, we are his offspring. Acts 17, 28. In him we're moving. Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, let me see, where, where am I at here? Keep moving. Keep going, sis. Next one. Colossians 1, 17. In him all things hold together. Next one. Hebrews 1, 3. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. Proverbs 16, 9. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes steps. This all has to do with providence. Amen. That God sets things up. Psalm 115, 3. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Providence. God's going to have his way. He's going to have his will. So i got to start closing here with a few thoughts. Providence is the invisible hand of God. It's invisible. Again, he doesn't roll no dice. But his hand's involved. He's in, Four attributes here. I trust his sovereignty. He's in control. He's in control. Second, predestination. In other words, he's in charge of how everything turns out. I trust him. Amen. I don't believe that people are predestined to go to hell. I believe that whosoever will, will be saved. 
But he, he knows how it's going to turn out. Goodness, he has our best interest at heart. I, mean, I trust his wisdom. He makes no mistakes. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12. Who else has held the oceans in his hand? What? The Atlantic, the Pacific, the Indian. He holds the oceans in his hand. Who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Oh, we're searching in that outer space moment. We got selfies from Mars this week. We're so excited we made it to Mars. God said, boy, you just getting started. I stretched the thing out with my hand, and I planted the heavens. Who else knows the weight of the earth or has weighed the mountains? God knows the weight of the earth you're struggling with your weight do you think when you gain weight the earth gets heavier you're going to ponder on that one all through lunch you're going to struggle with that thought right there oh when you lose weight the earth got lighter or oh, where did all the weight go ah see 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 who is able to advise the Spirit of the Lord? Who's going to give God advice? Who knows enough to give Him advice or teaching? Has the Lord ever needed anyone's advice? Does He need instruction? See, God, God is wisdom. God is love. He don't get more loving. He is love. God don't get stronger. He is strength. God don't get wiser. He is wise. That's who he is. This is that moment where you start, you know. <laughs> Has the Lord ever needed anyone's advice? Does he need instruction about what is good? Did someone teach him what is right or show him the path of justice? Joseph's life is the life of providence. You can't sugarcoat it, look away from it. His brothers were 100% responsible for their sins. But he said God meant it for good. It doesn't mean that evil is an evil. It just means that God is able to take the evil actions of sinful men and use them to accomplish his plans. Joseph saw the invisible hand of God at work in his life. Was it in the prison that he saw it? Was it in the pit that he saw it? Or was it before he ever went to the pit? He had revelation of it. But something sustained him. And he... And I have to believe it was somewhere back in that day where he picked up on it. That God has not forsaken me. He's not left me. Amen. His presence is still with me. Amen. He's with me in the pit. He's with me in Potiphar's house. He's with me in the prison. He's with me here. He's given me answers to dreams. I can see it. I see his hand at work. He understands that behind his convincing uh, conniving brothers stood the Lord God who had orchestrated the entire affair in order to get him to just the right place at just the right moment to save an entire nation. It's applied. Though your motives were bad, God's motives were good. Stand with me. Everybody said just the right moment. You never know exactly when that's going to be. But it's going to take place in your life and it actually already has. At just the right moment, they threw him in the pit. At just the right moment, the Midianites came along. You don't know how, how long was he in the pit till the Midianites got there. It was just the right moment. At just the right moment, they sold him to Potiphar. Was it the highest bidder? Why'd they take him? Maybe a nudge from his wife said, let's take that. At just the right moment, Potiphar's wife falsely accuses him. Just the right moment, he met a baker and a cupbearer in the right prison. At just the right moment, they remembered Joseph. At just the right moment, Pharaoh called for him. He was promoted to prime minister. Jacob sent his sons to Egypt. The brothers met Joseph. Jacob's family moved to Egypt. Pharaoh offered them the land of Goshen. At just the right moment, they settled there and prospered. In God, we got to trust Him. It's hard. It's hard when you're in the darkness. John the Baptist was in prison, about to be decapitated. 
And he's asked the word. He sent word. Are you really Jesus? Remember, you baptized me, John. You watched the dove descend from heaven and affirm who I am. Our confirmation took place in the wombs of our mothers. You know who I am. But when darkness, man, I don't care who you are, when the dark comes, it messes with you. He said, you tell John, the lame are walking, the blind see, the deaf hear. You tell him, blessed is he that's not offended in me. Understand it's the providence of God. And I, I, and I can't say that Jesus said this, but if I was Jesus, I'd put P.S. See you soon. Right? Because in just a little bit of time, Jesus is going to die. He'll be with John soon. See you soon. Trust him. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I know most of you. So I'm going to ask you the question. Do you really trust him? Or can you say with me, God, I'm going to do my best to quit belly aching about every little thing that happens. Or get frustrated over all the things that are going on around me. Things I can't change. And I'm going to trust you. If that message speaks to you this morning. Would you put your hand in the air? Proclaim it. You're watching online. I want you to trust him today. In God, we trust. I trust your providence. I trust you put me here for a reason. You connected me with these people for a reason. I ask your hand to be mildly upon the hands that are of God, that we trust you. Lord, we have struggled through life at times, but we know now you see the future. So we're going to put our trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Be seated for a moment. Our servant leaders are coming up. I've gone a little over time.